Greetings from the Wire Forest. It's such a joy to be able to join you and thank you so much for hosting us. Our reading for today is Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on this law day and night. This person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Amen, Lord. We want to be those that trust in your faithfulness and in your goodness and in your word. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and I'll let you guys catch a seat. Now, in the meantime, I would like a volunteer to come down and help me here at the front. Any volunteers? Yes, sir. You, sir, come down the front. Now... We, the other week, Sam did a little Antiques Roadshow skit, didn't he, with the seniors? And we saw a right load of old toot, didn't we? <laughs> oh, well, I tell you what, I have got an antique to date. So antique, you're going to have to put these on. These are special gloves, because don't, we don't want the acid in your hands and your skin upsetting the patina of this very valuable antique that I've got in here. An antique that is so old that probably only Uncle Biff will remember having seen one. <laughs> now, sorry, Uncle Biff. Now, I, I had to go on eBay to get this. And I mean, I, I've watched Bargain Hunt. Do you watch Bargain Hunt? No, no you're usually at school. I, I don't watch Bargain Hunt these days because I'm busy at work. <laughs> but I don't watch Bargain Hunt. But Uncle Viv does. He tells me it's very good. And he's got some antiques in his house. You want to go and visit them. Now, in this box, I have an antique. Now, I've had to keep it in this box because it, it shouldn't be too near the sunlight for too long. OK. Now, let me... There we go. Now, would you like to take that out? It's very old. Be very careful. I don't want it all falling apart. That's it. Very carefully pick it up. That's it. OK. Now, show it to the ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, that's funny. It's better than yours was. <laughs> oh, Stuart got out right old bit of took, didn't he? The Songs of Fellowship book. Hands up, who can remember this? Oh, yeah, they're showing their age now. Now, who can remember what the first song was? Abba Father. Now, do you see that? Abba Father. Now, you know why that's the first one in there? Well, because it begins with an A, and the second letter's a B. That tends to push it right to the front. Now, back in the day, when I was a youngster, we used to have a time of praise and worship in the, in the, the service. So normally we'd have a lot of hymns, which for a little bit... Mm, but then they used to say, we'll have a time of praise and worship. And we used to sit there, and we all have a copy of the book, and they say, what song shall we sing? And somebody would shout out a number. Shout me out a number. Seven. Number seven. Let's look. Number seven. Ooh, ooh, that's number eight. Not bad. Number seven. It's very difficult doing it with these gloves on, but we obviously don't want the pages to fall apart. Blessed are you, pure in heart. No, I don't remember that one. Give me another number. <laughs> 25. 25. Can you read music? Oh, yeah. Do you know this one? No. For I'm building a people of power. <laughs> Come on, then. For I'm building a people of power. And I'm making a people of praise. That's brilliant, isn't it? And, and we used to have fun doing that. It, it, was, like, it was like worship bingo. <laughs> worship bingo. And then we'd go back and we'd sing some old hymn. Well, thank you ever so much. I, I'll let you keep the gloves. You can, you, you'll look cool walking around town with those on. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you. I'll let you go and have a seat. Give him a hand. Thank you. There you go. So if some of you folk want to come and look at my antique at the end, you know, photocopy it. We'll get Pete to play some of those golden oldies later. Now, maybe... You know, we're thinking about the book of Psalms. Maybe you think that the book of Psalms, the Psalter, is a little bit like 
the Bible's own songbook. And in, and in some sense, it is. As you can see, there's a, a history of my, my church wanderings through different denominations. There aren't any charismatic songbooks up there because we didn't write the music down. We were just led by the Spirit. <laughs> but but, there, but the, the Psalter, the, Psalm, the book of Psalms, is full of individual psalms written by different people in different circumstances for different purposes very much like many of the worship songs that we have in that book. But at some point, someone or some committee under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit collected them all together and ordered them in a very specific way. Into what is, in fact, five books. There are five books that make up the book of the Psalms. There's nothing random about them. However, I do not have time to go into the formation of the Psalter and all the rest. You can ask me over a cup of coffee later. But largely speaking, one psalm will often relate to the one that either preceded it or follows it, like the chapters in the Bible. So bear that in mind. As you look at the psalms, look at the ones either side of it. But that leaves us with the question, why is Psalm 1 Psalm 1? Why pick that one to go in the front of the book? It's nothing to do with alphabetical order. It's not like Abba Father, is it? But why Psalm 1? Why not have a great big tub-thumping, praise the Lord psalm at the beginning? Melvin always used to say, have a real good tub-thumper to get the service going and then worry about the rest later. Or we could have a psalm of, of confession, of contrition or a lament. But Psalm 1 isn't one of those psalms. So why is Psalm 1 Psalm 1? Well, if you're going to worship the Lord, which is the chief end of man, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, you're going to have to approach God the right way. If you're going to be a follower of God, we need to understand there is a right way, the righteous way, and there is the wrong way, the wicked way. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are like an entrance. They're like a booking hall for men and women to come in to worship the Lord of heaven. They kind of go together, and you will see that next week when Scott comes to preach on Psalm 2. You need to come through the front door. But you need to remember, it's a narrow door. It's not an easy door to get through. Now, sometimes Ola comes to my house, and you've seen Ola with those big bags that she has on her, with all her books of marking. She has about three or four bags she has to uncumber herself of those books to get through my narrow door. And it's especially narrow on a life group night when everyone's stuck their shoes behind the door and you can't open it properly. There is a wide door, and I'm not talking about my garage door. There is a wide door, and that is an easy door. But that door, well, that door leads to destruction. And unfortunately, there's far too many people that want to use that door. But this narrow door, well, it might be difficult. It might not be easy. You might have to unencumber yourself, but it will lead to life, a happy life, a blessed life, an eternal life. Jesus says, be among the few that use that door. So let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 1, verse 1, right there at the beginning of Psalms. And it begins... Blessed is the one who, or you could say happy is the one who. Now, who doesn't want to be happy? Isn't that the pursuit of most rational people, that we want to be happy, we want to be satisfied, we want to be content, don't we? So surely, this psalm, if you want to have a happy life, will be worth paying attention to. And perhaps what might surprise you at the very outset of this psalm as you look at it is, is what blesses a person isn't initially what they do, it is what they avoid. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. What brings blessing now and in the future, is the kind of company you keep. Where you find your source of delight. Kids, who are you hanging around with? 
What situation, grown-ups, do you find yourself in that brings about happiness and satisfaction for you? Well, according to the psalmist, it's certainly not to be found with Mezza's wicked sinner and mocker, which you'd think would be fairly obvious. But as Ola says, is it? Is it? Meaning, it isn't. When you think about the wicked and the sinners and the mockers, do your minds immediately think of prostitutes, scammers and knife gangs? Not thinking about perhaps websites you shouldn't be going to, downloading illegal music and hanging out in a clique, cutting people with your tongue. But we think of people like this, like this, because, well, we can distance ourselves from them. We don't do that sort of stuff. But the wicked, the sinners and the mockers, well, they're the world, aren't they? This is the essence of worldliness. And we've had a whole sermon series looking at the problems of the world in 1 John. The wicked, in other words, the guilty. Sinners, those who miss the mark. Mockers, the ones who like to boast and brag and scoff, and especially on TikTok, on Twitter, online. You see them all the time. Now, apparently, a psychologist once asked an exceptionally old lady, what's the best thing about being 104 years old? She thought about it. She replied... No peer pressure. <laughs> there is an upside to getting old. Unfortunately, I would say, because none of you are 104, none of us can claim to have no peer pressure. Teachers, friends, parents, spouses, they all exert an influence in our lives for good or for bad. If you don't follow this trend, well, then there's something wrong with you. If you don't act this way, well, then you're not cool. Do you get that in school? If you don't laugh at what we're laughing at, you must agree with it. You're one of them. And to be honest, if we think about it, we do get a certain amount of satisfaction and happiness at looking at those things on our phone, streaming into our heads, listening to the counsel and advice of all that rubbish streaming into our lives day after day. And do you notice as well, there's a whole movement towards motionlessness. They walk. They stop. They sit. Married to the mockers of God. That's not wedded bliss. That's not the happy life. That's not the way we should live. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The psalmist says, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord, verse 2. You see, we all take our signals from somewhere. The psalmist says, don't take them from the world. Get them from the law of the Lord. Get that mind of yours renewed by God's law. Get your thinking washed in the word. We need to get our minds and our thinkings renewed. What is going in will soon come out. Hmm. But maybe we don't naturally associate delight with the law of the Lord, the Torah. Now, I know but there's a lot of young people in here this morning, um, unless some of them escaped with the younger ones. But there's a lot of young people, and they're probably struggling to tolerate my sermon at the moment, much less knowing how to delight in Deuteronomy or to love Leviticus. Let me warn you, you better start loving Leviticus because it's the sermon series next term. <laughs> now, we need to know, we need to know that delight is not the same as obedience. But please, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we can delight 
in the commands. Those are great rules, Mum and Dad. I think they're, they're wonderful. I can see how they're going to protect everybody, run a great, tight house. They're good for my brother, but I'm just not going to bother with them. That is not what I'm saying. You see, we tend, obedience tends to spring forth from obedience, the things that we delight in. Obedience springs forth from delight. We tend to do the things that we enjoy doing. It stands to reason, doesn't it? You do the things you enjoy. You kind of avoid the things you don't enjoy, the washing up or cleaning the oven. But there's no smoke without fire. You see, obedience and delight do go together, but smoke and fire are still very different things. So what do we mean by the word delight? You see, it's important to understand that the psalmist hasn't set this psalm up as sinning versus obeying. That's not what this psalm is about. That would be very legalistic, wouldn't it? But it would be a whole lot easier than doing what's actually being said, namely, whether we delight in sinful counsel versus delighting in God's counsel. Sinful advice... God's advice, the world's rules or God's rules. That's much more a matter of the heart. Now, one of the speakers at Keswick last week, he said, we're not intellectual people. And I don't think he was getting at our academic ability. He says, we're not thinking people. That's not what governs us. We're feeling people. We do the things. It's how we feel. We know that eating apples and carrots and fresh fruit is good for us. But if I put a bag of carrots on the table and a bag of donuts, which one would you go for? You know, you know in your head, but in your heart and your stomach, you'd go for the donuts because you feel you want that sugar rush. So what do we mean then by the law of the Lord, the Torah? Well, given that the, the Psalter, the book of Psalms, is shaped as five-book collection, as I mentioned earlier, it appears to mirror the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, we could say that those five books are the foundation on which the rest of the Old Testament is built, on which the rest of the Bible is built. So you've got the prophetic books, they're designed to remind and enforce us of what God's commands are. What is his law? It reminds us. The prophets were always reminding people of where people were forgetting God's law. There's the narrative books from Joshua to Esther. They graphically demonstrate what a life looks like of the person who delights in the law of the Lord. And it also graphically demonstrates what a life looks like of somebody that rejects God's law. Then there's the wisdom books, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job. Well, those books, if you think about them, they help us to apply God's instructions. They're there for all the different times of life, in the good times and in the bad times. And all this, though the psalmist might not have it in mind already... The Spirit would point us to the New Testament <coughs> where we see God fully revealed in the New Testament. We're to delight in God's Word, in His Bible, in His Scriptures. But how are we to meditate on the law of the Lord? It says meditate on the law of the Lord. And I suspect when I mention the word meditate, some of you might be thinking of sitting cross-legged in a dark room in total silence. Even biblical meditation, we're thinking of sitting quietly in an armchair, reflecting on a Bible passage. And that, that's not a bad thing to do. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But the Hebrew word for meditate has a whole range of meanings. And I'm just going to look at a few of them this morning. There's a whole range of meaning, but it's never quiet. It's always vocal. It's like reciting a memorised verse, like a memory verse. It can mean to be reading something that is written, like we had our Bible reading read by Leo this morning. It can indicate 
inarticulate groans and murmurs and sobs that come from deep within emotional thoughts. Finally, it can refer to singing. And I think that perfectly encompasses the three uses I've already mentioned. What better way of remembering scripture than by singing it? I can remember a lot more songs than I remember just reciting the Bible. It's definitely an activity that requires reading aloud. And what other exercise so engages our emotions and our thoughts? But however you meditate on God's word, do it all the time, the psalmist says, day and night. According to Deuteronomy, when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, before you go to bed, when you get up in the morning, when you greet people, everything should be seen through the lens of God's word. Fill your house with the sound of God's word, even your front garden, in season and out of season. So if meditating on God's word leads to the blessed life, what's the result of living this happy life? What will a person like that look like? Look at verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by a stream of water which yields fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And maybe you're envisaging a beautiful English countryside where there's a sycamore leaf that is blown gently on the breeze and it lands in a crystal or near a crystal clear stream and now has become a lush, fulsome sycamore tree. And perhaps lots of glossy covers of many Christian devotional books would perhaps reinforce that picture. But be assured, there's nothing random about this tree's position. Nothing has been left to mere fortune. This act of planting is very deliberate. In fact, the word suggests to be transplanted. Not just planted, transplanted, transferred. Now, I remember Amy Silver telling me that she used to have her little potting seeds and she used to put her little seedlings in there and give them their baby plant food and she'd look after them and tend them in the greenhouse. And then would come the day when they got to a certain size that she would transfer them to the garden where they'd get more nutrients, where they'd get more rain and more sunshine. That is the transferring of those little seeds and transferred and planted where they should be. And those streams of water, they're no babbling brooks meandering through the Yorkshire countryside or even the Worcestershire Shire countryside. They're irrigation canals cut through a dry and dusty land. If this tree is to flourish, then deliberate steps must be taken to bring that about. Is it time for some of you young folk maybe to be transplanted from your seedling pots and to be planted next to those mighty irrigation canals? Maybe some of you are about to move up and sit in the Sunday morning service. Let me encourage you, bring a book to take notes and write. Don't just count the lights on the ceiling. Or there's Engage on a Wednesday night where the Bible study happens. Or there's Base on a Thursday night where the youth come along. And what about you not so young folk? Are you being planted in God's word among God's people? Sunday morning services, student group, international Bible study, Tuesday group, seniors group, life group. Don't just be sitting there at home you know, on your own, reading your Bible, that's just like pouring a little watering can on your head. You need to be planted amongst God's people. Because only when you're properly planted will you drink down the water of life that refreshes the soul and brings life. And not just life to you, but to others. Look, you'll yield fruit in season. Not only will you develop a greater Christ-likeness as you develop that fruit of the Spirit. You'll literally produce offspring. The nations will hear God's word and become his offspring. And just to add, if you remember, a well-hydrated plant 
will grow tall, healthy and supple. And so it can blow and bend in the winds of life and still spring back. And finally, we hear that those who delight in the law of the Lord prosper in whatever they do. Now, don't overread that. And then ask, does that mean there's no reversals in life? Does that mean there'll be no setbacks for me? Because (coughs) you can't expect life to go without a hitch. That is what some false teachers would have you believe, but it is not true. No, not at all. That's not to read Psalm 1 in the context of the rest of the book of Psalms. Not even the next few chapters. But you don't have to read much further. Psalm 3, Psalm 4, Psalm 5 to realise that the life of the righteous is not all plain sailing. In fact, you have to get to Psalm 8 before things appear to pick up again. And don't you think the kind of success that we should be expecting is godlike success? <coughs> Big houses, fast cars, a buff bod and perfect health. Well, isn't that worldly success? If that's the kind of prospering that you're looking for, well, then you need to do a bit more time meditating on the law of God and a lot less time hanging out with Mezzer's wicked sinner and mocker. The prosperity, the success that the righteous can expect cuts through the rubbish of this world. It reminds us to keep our eyes fixed on the prize. It stops us trying to take those shortcuts. There's just simply a quick fix, a buzz, a high, but you'll soon come down off of those. It will leave you like like it left Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. Do you remember? He thought he'd take a shortcut, ended up in the slough of despond, the marsh of misery. The righteous, those who delight in the law of the Lord, will prosper, maybe not right away. Some investments take time to mature, but it will be prosperity that will last for eternity, and it will never cease to satisfy. And what's the result of not delighting in the law of the Lord? Well, those hanging out with Mezzer's wicked sinner and mocker, delighting in their company, well, they're like chaff that is blown away on the wind, verse 4. And in case you don't know what chaff is, it's like that dry outer skin that goes around the grain of the seed. Think of a peanut shell. It's flavourless, it has no nutritional value, and it simply gets in the way when you're trying to get to the seed, the fruit. So what do farmers do? They throw the whole lot up into the air so it separates. The seed falls back into the basket. The chaff is just blown away, never to be seen again. You see, delighting in the wrong stuff will suck your life dry. Unlike that supple plant that we saw that bent in the winds of life, the dry plant will simply snap and break in the breeze. And dry plants make excellent fuel for fire. The wicked become the very kindling material of the fires of hell itself. There are four statements made about the righteous which contrasts with the one statement made about the wicked. The righteous are stable because they are deliberately planted. The wicked, they're just blown away on the wind. The righteous produce fruit. The wicked are the bit you throw away. The righteous are durable. They don't wither. The wicked crumble to dust in the face of adversity. The righteous prosper eternally The wicked, like their fads, are here today and gone tomorrow. Now, Psalm 1 ends with a big fat therefore. It asks, what will happen when the end comes? In other words, are you ready for judgment day? Ooh, it's taking a decided turn for the serious. But it's a serious question. It's a serious issue. It can't be ignored. It can't simply be sung away. And you need to remember, the psalmist is addressing all of Israel 
in this Psalm 1. Who else were the Psalms written for if it wasn't for all of Israel? The wicked aren't those people out there washing their cars and not coming to church. They're also part of the visible church, just as much as the righteous are part of the visible church. And it's only at the judgment that it will be revealed who is who. Those who followed the way of righteousness or those who followed the way of the wicked. For the righteous, it says, the Lord will watch over them forever. For the wicked, there is destruction. Now at the beginning, I said, Psalm 1 was like the door by which we entered to worship God. I want you to listen to what Jesus says in John's Gospel. Very truly, I tell you, I am the door for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. You see, ultimately, we can't make ourselves righteous by doing stuff. Even doing all the good stuff that we've read about in Psalm 1 and avoiding the bad stuff. Although Psalm 1 is full of sound principles for keeping us on the straight and narrow. Living that godly life. So don't ignore that. But we must enter the door through Jesus. We must walk in his steps. Which means picking up our cross and carrying it daily. We must stand with him, surrounded by the mockers and the false accusers. We must sit in his company, with the company of believers around the communion table. We must delight in his commands, as we've been learning about in 1 John this term. You get the idea. This psalm and the next one, Psalm 2, are about Jesus. And they're only properly understood and fulfilled in him. Let's not end our days the way we end this psalm, in destruction. Let's end our days the way we began this psalm. Blessed, happy, living the life of happiness. There are two ways to live. Choose Jesus. Let me pray. Lord God, we pray that we will be those people, like that tree planted by the streams of living water, that we will be so close to you that we would drink of your word, that we would follow you, that, Lord, that we want to grow, we want to be fruitful, and we know that is not going to happen by accident, but we need to put ourselves in the right place. We need to enter that narrow door through Jesus, and we need to stay with Jesus And so we pray that, Lord, that your spirit would help us. It would continue to grow that fruit in our lives. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.